Speaker, and it's exciting to see you joining us and being with us this late in the, in the evening and uh, wrapping up the evening with us, so we're thankful for that. Uh, I've got a number of questions I just want to ask tonight to kind of wrap this up, and I guess one of the, one of the main questions as I've sat here and listened tonight is I, I fail to understand why is it that the Liberals don't even seem to know the basics of what this law is about? I've heard a number of things this, this evening that are, are really concerning. They don't seem to know uh, what the past uh, requirements were for, for background checks. I've heard a number of people talking about that. They don't seem to understand that they've been adequate in the, ba in the past. There's been uh, a, a good system in place for doing background checks and one that's worked well for Canadians. Uh, they don't seem to know that firearms owners actually have to be to be registered, be licensed themselves in order to be able to own a firearm. And uh, earlier we heard someone uh, t asking about that, why do you treat, why do you treat uh, guns differently than some other things? Well, the reality is with, with firearms, you actually need to be registered yourself. You have to take the course and get the certification and be able to go through that. Um, I was really concerned a little bit earlier about uh, the, why the Liberals approach firearms owners the way that they do. When the member for Oakville North said, all gun owners are law-abiding until they aren't. I really wondered what it was that she meant by that. You see, there's some sort of attitude of superiority that the Liberals come with in regards to firearms owners. And we've seen this for 25 years. We saw it with C-68. We saw it with the fact they would never back down on that legislation. It cost them dozens of ridings across this country several elections later. And then they come back this time with another piece of legislation. And I think we're beginning to see both in Ontario and the results in Quebec tonight, the, that attitude that the Liberals have that is starting to irritate Canadians, and I think we're going to see a response to that, an even better response from our perspective in the next federal election. I don't think also that, uh, that, that uh, the Liberals understand that actually there's no right to firearms ownership in this country, and I think everyone needs to be re reminded of that, that actually the only reason we can own firearms is because the, the government gives us permission, and when I talk to my uh, friends with the wildlife federations and those kinds of things, they say, you need to help Canadians understand that. We don't have a right to own firearms. If we don't get licensed, we're actually criminals. And they, they, are, they resent that, but they, they'll, they'll accept the fact that we need to have a licensing regime in place. And then another concern that I have, Madam Spe or Mr. Speaker, is I'm just wondering why those Liberals who have firearms owners in their ridings don't seem to be willing to listen to them. And I want to point out that at, at the committee, uh, the leader of the opposition in the Yukon legislature was not allowed to speak. And I'm told there wasn't a single northern Canadian that was able to testify how this bill is going to impact their way of life. And I just want to read a little bit of what his briefing said, that unlike the provinces, Yukon only has one member of parliament. This leads to situations where the input of northerners is often an afterthought and not taken into account. This is the case with this piece of firearms legislation. And I can tell you there are others. I've got a, another, another notice from the, uh, in this situation from the uh, Yukon Fish and Game Association are very concerned that they can't track down their MP and talk to him about this issue. This is a member who's been around on this issue before. He should be standing up for his constituents. Why is it that the Liberals in the rural ridings, the ones whose constitu constituents depend <coughs> on having access to firearms for much of their livelihood, why are they not speaking out? As my colleague mentioned a little bit earlier, we heard about a few of the ridings where there was concern about this. But these Liberals need to speak out. We're getting to the end of this piece of legislation, and it's basically the, the re-establishment of a semi-long gun registry that every, every provision or every transaction that takes place at a, uh, at a gun store is going to be recorded for 20 years with the, the, the firearm, the, the serial number, the, uh, the name of the person who's bought it, along with their PAL number. That certainly is all the makings and all the components of a, of a, a firearms registry, and we don't hear anything from the other side. Another concern is why is it that the Liberals always need to manipulate things on this file? And I can go on about this for a long time, but I just found it very interesting that the, the minister uh, from, uh, from Regina, who is the public uh, safety minister, has appointed a number of people to the Firearm Safety Committee who are, are clearly against firearms in any way, shape or form. And it's interesting that one of them was appointed and ended up being the vice chair of position. Um, she was a, a lobbyist. And she said she would step down from her lobbying activities. And actually, the agreement that she signed said, quote, that she's not to engage in lobbying activities or work as a registered lobbyist on behalf of an entity making submissions or representations to the Government of Canada on issues relating to, members, to the mandate of this committee. And yet, 10 months after signing that, this person 
uh, submits a legislative demand to the Government of Canada under the, the letterhead of that organization and with her signature on it. And Mr. Speaker, I could go through it if I had more time, but many of the provisions of the bill happen to be uh, just exactly as she's laid them out. So is she actually doing the bidding of the government? Or is the government doing the bidding of lobbyists who said they're not going to lobby the government and then turn around and do that? And I can give you another example of where the, the government has felt some sort of necessity for manipulating every piece of data that they can on this issue, and that's around the issue of statistics. And as Mark Twain said, facts are stubborn things, but statistics are pliable. And with this government, that is certainly more true than, than it, most anything else we can say about it. Uh, the reality has been mentioned a little bit earlier here that uh, 2013 was one of the lowest uh, years ever for uh, firearms <laughs> crimes. And it's interesting that even CBC recognized that the Liberals are, are playing uh, games with this, uh, this situation. They write, 2013 saw Canada's lowest rate of criminal homicide in 50 years and the lowest rate of fatal shootings ever re recorded by Stats Canada. Every year since 1966 has been worse than 2013. So Liberals take a, take a year when the stats are lower than they've ever been, then they use that to set their base and then compare it to today, and today is still below the 30-year average. But if you listen to their news releases, it completely misleads Canadians. And when government has to resort to that kind of manipulation and misinformation, you understand that they are not very comfortable even with the legislation that they're bringing in. It goes on, it, it just talks about the rate of, of uh, homicide rate in 2018 will be similar or lower than it was in 2008 or 1998, well below 1988 and 1978, and similar to what it was in 1968. And, Mr. Speaker, we certainly didn't get that uh, from the Liberal press release that we saw. A number of other important issues I think we need to touch on. A uh, member across the way tonight was speaking. I wanted to ask him a question. That was about the Assembly of First Nations, because they have said that Bill C-71 uh, came forward without them being consulted on it. They also say that they believe it violates their treaty rights and that they're going to launch a constitutional challenge. It's interesting. We've heard nothing about that and no response to it from this government. They claim to be wanting and working with these communities, and when it comes down to their legislation, they're very happy to set them aside, ignore everything that they have to say about it, and just, and just go on. We've heard some comment tonight about C-75 and C-71 kind of playing off of each other. So we have a bill C-75, where all kinds of penalties are, being, are basically being uh, written off for serious crimes. So things like terrorism, we're reducing the charges to, we're getting, you know, can you imagine a summary conviction for terrorism uh, activity? Uh, genocide is actually being, the, the, puni the punishment for genocide is being reduced in C-75. Organized criminal activity, uh, municipal corruption, all those things are being re re reduced in C-75, and then they come back to honest gun owners in C-71 and make their life even more complicated and bureaucratic than it's ever been in their life. Why are they doing that? Why is it that they gang up on, on uh, Canadian citizens, but all of these other gangs are happy to leave them to go, go through life uh, the way that they want? It's another issue around mental health issues, and we heard a, a member earlier tonight talk about how proud she was of, of her of her amendment, and I'm sure she had good intentions when she put it in, but it's not just, we're not just criminalizing activity anymore, we're criminalizing possible intent. And I'd like to know who, how a CFO, she mentioned the CFOs will make these distinctions, how they're going to decide if someone is suicidal or not. What CFO wants to take on that responsibility for their entire province of trying to find every person who's going to be, who has a mental health issue? It's been pointed out here earlier at the committee, it was mentioned, police and veterans who have things like PTSD or have, are, 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 who want to go forward and get some help with mental health issues. Are they going to go forward? Why would they do that with an amendment with a bill like this when those kinds of things come into play and they'll come into play in their, in their lives, in their careers, and, and with a, a tool that they use every day in, in the occupation that they carry on? So, Mr. Speaker, we can be very proud of the record that we've had. I know it's just about wrapping up here, and I'm sorry that that's the case, but uh, we brought in a number of pieces of legislation. We've been criticized tonight, but in terms of youth, uh, youth violence, we brought in a youth justice fund. Uh, gangs, gun, and drugs component of the youth justice fund was launched to focus on the rehabilitation of youth. We've created a youth gang prevention fund. We're happy and very proud of that. We've supported a national crime prevention strategy, an Aboriginal and Northern crime prevention fund. We passed bills that, that dealt uh, with organized crime and the protection of justice system. And, Mr. Speaker, we're always trying to protect the victims and making sure that the criminals were the one who paid the price for their crimes. This bill is a long ways from that. 
why we can go through an entire bill that's supposed to deal with gun violence and gangs that doesn't mention either of those things while targeting uh, normal law-abiding citizens one more time, I will never understand.